Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the um, Near and Middle East Postgraduate Taster Session. My name is Hussam Al Malak, and I'll be hosting you. Thank you very much for joining us, um, wherever you are. Um, I'll be providing you with a taster session on from a module that um, is running um, on the Near and Middle East um, MA program. So if you're taking the uh, MA and Near Middle East uh, program next year, this will be a compulsory um, module. Um, it's about the Near and Middle East. It's called um, the Middle East in 10 Sessions. Um, so it's a 10 week module. Um, I'll be providing um, the session on religion, Islam, and the modern Middle East, which is today's session. Um, it's a much more condensed session than the normal lecture. Um, I will provide um, time um, later on for questions and answers where we can um, discuss anything that you're interested in discussing. Um, I teach here in SOAS. My speciality is modern Islamic thought. I actually did my PhD at SOAS and um, I teach um, a postgraduate module, um, Modern Trends in Islam. So this taster session is also a very um, condensed overview of some of the trends that are discussed and examined in much more detail, a lot more detail in that um, postgraduate module, Modern Trends in Islam. Concerning the Middle East, um, Coming to SOAS, um, you're going to be studying uh, um, dimensions of either Asia or Africa. And I always think of the Middle East as that um, landmass that connects the two together. Um, to understand the Middle East, I always think that religion generally and Islam particularly is crucial to an insightful understanding and examination of the Middle East, specifically the modern Middle East, where religion and Islam in particular continues to be a very important um, dimension within the Middle East. It influences um, culture, media, um, politics, obviously, and many other dimensions. So, when people speak about Islam, um, it's rather very general. And from today's session, um, I'm going to be presenting you with an overview that there are in fact many different trends and dimensions of Islam. There's a lot of um, overlaps between these different um, modern trends, but there are also crucial distinctions between the two. So this module, uh, this, safe, this session will pre present you with an overview of these different modern trends that have roots in the modern Middle East. And it presents you with um, these different modern trends, these present you with a different perspective of the modern Middle East, a perspective that um, I suspect many of you would have encountered um, through the media, through um, politics and journalism. So this um, module, um, next year's module, um, and this session presents you with a different perspective. It's an um, academic specialist um, perspective I thought I'd start off this session with a map, a map of the Middle East, um, albeit presenting it from a different dimension, a map from the 12th century. Um, uh, he's a, a geographer, Muhammad al-Idrisi, um, Andalusian and North African geographer. Um, that presents the Middle East from a perspective we are not um, very familiar with. For those of you who might um, 
be training or will be training in Arabic. Um, you might be able to read some of the writings on this um, 12th century map of the Middle East, but actually it's also a map of the wider world at that time. In the center of the map, you have the Middle East. Um, you will, for those of you who um, have already um, picked up on it, um, this uh, map where presents North as being South and East um, being presented in from the West. And um, so um, there's a flip side of the different um, um, directions. Um, here is the Yemen and the Arabian Peninsula, Iraq, um, Egypt, and North Africa um, on your right hand side. Whilst on the extreme left hand side, you'll see China and, and India. Um, for those of you who are um, um, familiar with um, Islamic religion and Arab culture, you would have heard about. Um, yeah, Juj and, and Juj, or in the English, Yog and Magog, um, pre presented as being the extremes of the world um, here in the uh, bottom left corner. And um, obviously, in the bottom right, you'll see Europe, um, the Iberian Peninsula, France, and um, Central Europe. Um, so a map that presents um, the world, but particularly the Middle East from a different perspective, and which is what we will do as well in this module, um, but in this session as well, looking at um, the different trends and different understandings of Islam that are very influential in the modern Middle East. I'm focusing on three main trends that are influential in the modern Middle East. These being Islamism, uh, Salafism, and progressive or liberal Islam. Usually, um, with the last trend, you'll see um, academics uh, conflating these two uh, with each other. There are differences. Uh, if you're interested, we might have some time later on to go back and just talk about these differences. Islamism, Salafism, and progressive uh, understandings of Islam. Islamism remains um, one of the oldest modern interpretations, modern trends of Islam that has roots in the modern Middle East. It's a very modern trend um, defined as a form of instrumentalization of Islam by individuals, groups, and organizations that pursue political objectives. So Islamism is a trend that seeks to present, to develop and articulate political solutions to political challenges. Challenges that um, Muslims in the Middle East would confront in modern times. It presents a political response to these modern challenges that were faced by Muslims in the Middle East around the turn of the 20th century and continues to be a very prominent and popular trend. Um, it's a trend that can be identified with individuals. Um, particular individuals in the Middle East are identified as being Islamists. Um, there are groups and organizations that um, are identified as being Islamist, but also with the uh, very notable example of Iran, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, where you actually have a modern nation state that exemplifies and manifests Islamism as a modern trend. Um, what is it, uh, more details about Islamism? What is it that distinguishes Islamism and Islamists? I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but some of the um, prominent Islamists um, and that, um, that are um, important in the development of this trend. Um, some of you might have some um, people in mind already. Um, Hassan al-Banna. Um, from Egypt, um, known for being the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, 
one of the first and most uh, oldest and continues to be a very prominent Islamist organization. Um, Sayyid Qutb, also from Egypt, who was a very prominent ideologue of the Muslim Brotherhood in particular, but Islamism in general. And his thought continues to be very influential um, amongst Islamists in the Middle East and beyond. Um, has very different uh, kinds of influence, um, Sayyid Qutb. Um, the late Ayatollah um, Ruhullah al Khomeini, um, who was the uh, supreme leader of the Iranian uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, the leader of the Iranian Revolution, and he I, um, formulated an Islamist ideology that continues to be the ruling ideology of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Another prominent and influential Islamist, uh, very prominent in the modern Middle East, is um, Hassan Nasrullah, who is the Secretary General of the Islamist Shi'i Islamist organization, Hezbollah. So these are some prominent Islamists. Um, Qutb and Khomeini are ideologues. So they developed um, their understanding of Islamism. They wrote about it. And um, their ideologies continue to be very prominent, not only in the Middle East, but also beyond the Middle East. So that which distinguishes Islamism are its doctrines, but also from an academic perspective, we look at the way that Islamists engage with the primary sources, the primary texts of Islam as a religion, mainly here the Quran. Um, Islamists generally aim or seek to apply Islamic law which is commonly referred to as the Sharia, ah, but um, we can um, later on um, discuss whether or not this is an accurate term, um, whether or not Sharia ah can be um, used to describe um, Islamic law. They seek to apply Islamic law as state law. So the laws of the modern nation state um, by which modern uh, Middle Eastern societies are ruled and governed. That's usually the primary aim that distinguishes um, Islamism as a modern trend. And they will argue that um, to, to, uh, to realize this aim of applying Islamic law as state law, they will try to realize this through politics and engaging in modern day politics. Um, as I mentioned, Hassan al-Banna was um, the earliest um, of the Islamists in the Middle East. Um, Islamism also developed elsewhere beyond the Middle East and the um, subcontinent in India and later on in Pakistan. But the oldest Islamist organization continues to be that which was founded by Hassan al-Banna, um, the Muslim Brotherhood, which has a very long history of um, political engagement in the modern um, nation state of uh, Egypt. In, um, around 10 years ago after the Arab Spring, the Muslim Brotherhood through democratic elections um, managed to um, acquire political power and they would in fact um, rule modern day Egypt for one year before they were later subsequently overthrown. So again, just to emphasize just how important um, the import, the influence of the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamists um, continues to this day. Qutb's contribution, ideological contribution to Islamism was his formulation of these doctrines, Islamist doctrines he referred to as Jahiliya and Hakimiya. So anyone familiar with Islam as a religion will recognize this term Jahiliya, which is used to, to um, describe the period before Islam uh, the religion, the revelation of Islam with the Prophet Muhammad in the uh, seventh, um, sixth, seventh century AD. 
But Qutb now will go back to this Quranic concept and he will reformulate it. He will now um, um, interpret Jahiliya as not a historic position, a historic epoch, but, all, but rather a condition, a condition, a social condition whereby Muslim societies are not ruled by Islamic law. And from his um, own modern day perspective, he thought and he assessed that many modern day societies in the Middle East, even though these societies identified themselves as being Muslims, he argued in his very famous um, book, um, Milestones, Ma'alim Fattariq, he argued that in fact, these societies, these individuals are nowadays in a state of jahiliya. Jahiliya contrasted with his other condition, he would also formulate um, known as hakimiya, um, can be um, translated in different ways, but generally refers to a form of divine sovereignty. Divine sovereignty in a way by which Islamic law reflects this form of divine sovereignty, sovereignty in a social dimension. Ayatollah Khomeini's own ideology was reflected in his doctrine of Wilayat al faqih um, or Vilayati Faqih from the Persian um, pronunciation. Um, he argued that Islamic law also has to apl be applied by a modern day. Um, government. His um, interesting um, formulation concerning the form of governance was that he argued that, that such an Islamic government has to be led by a Muslim jurist, person, a jurist who specializes in Islamic law, which was a very unique formulation of Khomeini's um, um, doctrine of Wilayat al-Faqih to be distinguished from its Sunni counterparts, um, whereby Khomeini argues that um, the Islamic government and Islamic government has to be led by a specialist of Islamic law, the Faqih. Islamists generally are distinguished by their political and ideological interpretations of the Quran. So from an academic perspective, how is it that we can distinguish Islamists from other Muslims um, in the Middle East or beyond um, is by the way, um, by their aims, the aim to establish Islamic law as state law, but particularly by the way they interpret the Quran. They will project their own modern ideologies, political worldviews and project these back onto their interpretations of the Quran. And they will develop some very unique interpretations of, uh, of the Quran as the primary source of um, Islamic religiosity. So that's a very quick and very brief overview of Islamists, their doctrines, their hermeneutics, and the science, the methodologies of interpretations, textualist interpretations. And as I mentioned, the Islamists continue to be a very prominent um, player in the modern Middle East, um, beyond the Middle East, in North Africa, and in the subcontinent, in Southeast Asia. But the oldest of the organizations is the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, the Sunni Islamist organization, but so too is the Shia Islamist organization, Hezbollah. Um, there's another very prominent Islamist organization that has a, a very prominent role to play in the uh, politics of Palestine and Israel, that being Hamas. And as I mentioned earlier on, the Islamic Republic of Iran can, um, reflects um, the a modern Islamist nation state. So these are the Islamists. And the Islamists are to be distinguished from another equally popular and influential modern trend um, known as the Salafis or Salafism. 
Salafism refers to a term, Salaf. Salaf means those that came before, those who preceded. And it refers to the first three generations of the early Muslim community. So it refers to the Muslim community of the prophets and the generation immediately after that and the generation after that. It refers to the pious forebearers of Islam, that being the first three generations of the Muslim community. It is in fact a very modern trend, a modern trend in the sense that these uh, Salafis, these Salafi Muslims, seek to go back and emphasize um, the piety and principles of that, uh, of that um, early Salafi generation or generations as uh, reflecting the correct understanding of Islam. So Salafis will argue that all interpretations and developments in Islamic thought and Islamic practices after these three generations reflect what they will refer to as an innovation, bid'a, be it in the establishment of the schools of Islamic law, uh, the schools of jurisprudence, um, the madhahib, they will be very critical of developments in Islamic um, theology, kalam, um, very critical of philosophical developments, but also very distinctively critical of um, mystical and Sufi developments. And um, this understanding that there was something very special about the first three generations of Muslim community is rooted in a tradition, a saying uh, attributed to the um, prophet, where he is now reported to have said that the best of the community are those of his generation and the one that come after them and the one that come after them. So this understanding of Salafism is in fact rooted in the um, another very important Islamic textual source, um, the hadiths, which um, from a, a come in, in importance immediately after the Qur'an, the Qur'an being the primary source of Islamic um, thought on religiosity, but the hadith um, comes um, second. But in practical terms, the hadith is by far more extensive um, than the Qur'an, so it becomes a means by which um, Salafis are able to identify what they consider to be the correct understanding of Islam. So you'll see, in fact, Salafis um, engaging in the study of hadiths more than anything else. Who are those Salafis? Well, Salafism as a modern trend, a uh, modern trend um, has its roots in the modern Middle East. It has origins in Egypt in the um, 1920s and 30s, but as a very distinctive modern trend, it arose um, well, in the, um, what we now refer to as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And some of the most prominent of the um, earlier scholars of Salafism, uh, Muhammad Nasruddin al-Albani, who uh, from his name, you can tell he came from Albania, uh, but he grew up in Syria and later on um, he, he taught in Saudi Arabia, but um, was going to be exiled and um, he would later on died in Jordan. Um, the previous um, grand jurist of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Abdul Aziz bin Baz, um, another very prominent Salafi scholar, but you have a new generation of Salafis and um, Salman al Oda, who's also uh, from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia but um, Hazm Sal um, Salah Abu Ismail, who comes from Egypt and became very prominent um, after the Arab Spring. He was um, one of the presidential candidates um, or before he was disqualified and after the um, overthrow of the um, Muslim Brotherhood, um, he was going to be um, imprisoned, continues to be imprisoned in Egypt, but so too is Salman al Oda, who is also imprisoned in modern day kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, both for their political views and um, articulations. 
a brief overview of Salafi doctrines. Um, they believe in a puritanical understanding of Tawheed, Tawheed being the unity of God, which is what um, all Muslims believe in as an article of faith and belief. And they will seek to denounce any form of um, what's known as association or shirk, any practices that challenge the doctrine of Tawheed. So for example, seeking the blessings of individuals or the, um, or the building of shrines of pious uh, individuals, be they Sufis or Shias, for example, the, the uh, Salafis will consider that these um, challenge the doctrine of the unity of God. And therefore these individuals who um, who venerate these individuals or these shrines are now committing the cardinal sin of shirk or association, which actually can lead to their excommunication. So Salafis can now subsequently engage in a process of excommunicating takfir of other Muslims, Muslims who might engage in these practices or beliefs that Salafis consider to challenge the doctrine of Tawheed. A prominent feature of Salafis is that they will prioritize a literal understanding of the revelation, the Quran, but so to the hadiths over reason and rationality. That's not to say that they are anti-rationalists or non-rationalists, but whenever there appears to be a tension or a conflict between the literal interpretation of the text or, or reason and rationality, revelation is now um, prioritized. A very prominent doctrine um, what is the doctrine known in Arabic as al-wala wal-bara, whereby Salafis will argue that Muslims generally, including themselves, have to show and display loyalty and friendly friendliness to God and other Muslims and to disavow non-Muslims, um, which became very problematic in, uh, during the um, Gulf War, the 1990-1991 Gulf War, when the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia sought the help, military help and assistance of the United States and the United Kingdom and France and other um, Western governments and to defend them against um, what they perceived to be as the aggression of the Iraq at that time. And Salafis argued that this was now um, showing a form of loyalty or friendliness towards non-Muslims. And they argued that this was a, a challenge to the doctrine of al-wala and wal-bara, um, loyalty to Muslims and disavowal of non-Muslims. Um, Salafis will engage in the study of the texts, the Arabic texts, the Quran, as I mentioned, but also the hadiths. And in that sense, they require um, to have a mastery of the Arabic language, philology, which is the study of the Arabic language, the sciences, and the texts. Even though Salafism is a very prominent um, trend in the modern Middle East, but it's also a transnational movement in Europe and um, in Asia, as well as in Africa. And you'll see Salafis everywhere in the Muslim world, especially those who do not have command of the Arabic language, they will engage in the academic study of the Arabic language. And in fact, you will note that Sawas is a very prominent institution, academic institution of the Arabic language and the Arabic texts. Um, Salafis will interpret the Quran and the Hadith in what's known as a decontextualist method of interpretation or hermeneutic methodology. Um, regardless of the context of revelation, what happened at the time of revelation, that is not to be prioritized or um, awarded significance in the way um, that Salafis will interpret these texts. The meanings of these 
texts are, is understood quite literally, and it is non-historicist in the sense that these meanings are applicable at all times and um, at all places as well. They will also follow what's known as a segmental interpretation of the text. So they will, um, they can take a part of the revelation and interpret it and understand it in um, without any relation to the other um, parts of the wider text in the Quran, but also the hadiths as well. It's known as a, a segmental approach towards the interpretation of the texts. That's a very quick overview of the doctrines of Salafis, Salafism, and their methodology of interpreting the texts, which again becomes very distinctive. It distinguishes the Salafis from the other um, trends. So after the Arab Spring, um, Salafis, who for a very long time were very critical of Islamists, and critical of political uh, the political association of Islamists, in Egypt, it was seen that in fact, Salafis did um, seek political representation and they engaged in parliamentary elections, um, presidential elections, and it became rather difficult to distinguish between Salafis and the Islamists. They were in fact um, in a coalition with each other. Um, but there could still be, they could still be distinguished from each other um, by the methodology by which they would interpret the texts, the Quran and the Hadith. And by extension, it means that they can come up with different interpretations of Islamic law. So that remains a crucial methodology by which to distinguish between Salafis and Islamists. The third and equally important Islamic trend in the Middle East, which is not only significant in the Middle East, but also in the wider um, context, geographic context, um, Muslims all over the world, in Europe, North America, um, in Africa, South Africa, but crucially in the subcontinent and in Southeast Asia is that trend known as the progressives or liberals. According to a scholar, Omid Safi, in a uh, text um, he edited, Progressive Muslims, he refers, he describes progressive Islam as a form of Islamic humanism. He refers to it as, as an interpretation of Islam for the 21st century. Um, he states that at the heart of the progressive Muslim interpretation is a simple yet radical idea that every human life, female and male, Muslim and non-Muslim, rich or poor, northern or southern, has exactly the same intrinsic worth. He argues that Progressive is a relentless striving towards a universal notion of justice in which no single community's prosperity, righteousness, and dignity comes at the expense of another. Crucial features of the modern academic understanding of progressive Islam. And this is very distinctive. Progressive Muslims are in fact um, generally um, themselves are academics and scholars. And in that sense, progressive Islam reflects an academic um, Islamic trend, albeit it has become very prominent, among, not only in the Middle East, but also in Southeast Asia, um, whereby um, Muslims uh, have now become more, uh, more progressive Islam has taken root amongst um, um, generations of um, South, uh, Southeast Asian um, Muslims. Who are some of those progressive Muslims coming from uh, the Middle East? Well, um, Abdullah Naim, an a, a Suma, a Sudani um, uh, progressive Muslim um, academic scholar, um, who's actually now based in the, uh, the United States. 
Abdul Karim Surush, um, an Iranian um, progressive Islamic scholar. He, he specializes in Islamic neo theology. Um, another um, um, Iranian scholar, um, Ziba Mir Husseini, she specializes in the anthropology of Islamic law, and we're very lucky to have her based here in SOAS. Um, she engages, uh, she researches uh, and teaches here in SOAS. And um, another progressive Islamic scholar was the late Nasser Hamid Abu Zaid, um, who came from Egypt. So it reflects the academic background and nature of progressive Islam. Um, three main themes that might distinguish progressive Islam, according to Omid Safi in that text I mentioned earlier, are the themes of social justice, gender justice, and pluralism. Social justice that seeks to challenge any forms of discrimination in society, socioeconomic or political, racial discrimination. In that sense, scholars from South Africa, who were some of the earliest scholars to develop and formulate progressive Islam, Islamic thought as a response to um, apartheid and racism in South Africa, and um, such um, themes of, of social justice were going to become very prominent of um, progressive and liberal um, Muslims all over the world, but so too in the Middle East. Gender justice is another prominent theme. In fact, most of the progressives will be um, will focus on this uh, on this theme of gender justice, gender equality that seeks to challenge um, patriarchy. Um, any form of discrimination against women, um, unjust um, discrimination against women, and members of sexual um, minorities as well. And pluralism, another prominent of the um, progressive um, Islamic interpretation. Pluralism beyond tolerance. It's no longer just um, good enough to tolerate others that um, one has disagreements with, but to um, accept others, that be they um, others of different religious orientation, um, different um, nationality, different race, and um, different understandings of Islam, and an affirmation of otherness according to this theme of pluralism. Progressives understand that the Quranic text reflects, is, is understood to be a literary text. It is divine in its origins, but it has a crucial human dimension as well. And in that sense, it also is subjected to modern literary criticism, which is what so many of these modern uh, scholars will engage in. In their interpretations of these texts, they will privilege uh, moral values and ethical values, and values such as justice, dignity, and mercy over the literal interpretation of the texts. They will also um, develop and formulate and apply what's known as the contextualist readings of the texts, particularly the Quran, to understand what the Quran means, the Quranic verses, particularly the legal verses, which is in fact not that many. Um, progressives will look at the wider context of revelation to understand what that, what any particular Quranic um, verse means. Um, it's not good enough to understand the, um, the text in isolation of the wider socioeconomic, political, cultural context of society at that time. So you'll see a lot of these um, progressive scholars are sociologists, are historians, are legal scholars, and these different spe um, specializations become crucial in the modern contemporary reinterpretations of the Quran. They will also develop, um, a, they will adopt a holistic 
or sometimes a thematic interpretation of the Quran, which has become very um, distinctive of feminist interpretations of the Quran. Uh, another very prominent feature of the progressive um, Islamic discourse is their critical engagement or approach to the hadiths, the sayings attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, and the narrations, even though these might have been considered to have been authentic in pre-modern times, um, progressive scholars will go back and adopt a critical approach, um, not to say a dismissive, but a rather a critical approach to the hadiths. To the sayings and uh, narratives um, attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. So that was a very quick and general overview of three modern trends, trends that have roots are very prominent in the modern Middle East. To understand the modern Middle East, um, religion is prominent, Islam is instrumental in understanding the modern Middle East, I personally would argue, but Islam is not a unit, um, is not, uh, there is no just one, un, one authoritative understanding of Islam um, that dominates in the modern Middle East. In fact, as we have seen, there are three, if not actually more, um, different understandings of Islam, different Islams that have roots in the modern Middle East and beyond. And as I mentioned, so this is one taster session of that, uh, of that module, um, um, the Middle East in 10 sessions. But it was also a very, very quick overview of some of the trends and issues that we can also, that um, I examine in more detail in that um, module, Modern Trends in Islam. If you have any questions um, about any of this, if we don't have time to um, discuss them, you're more than welcome to email me, um, Hussam al Malak, ha10 at sawas.ac.uk. On that note, um, thank you very much for your attention and um, happy to answer any of your questions. Just before we start on the um, question and, and answer the Q&A session, um, may I please present my apologies for not having managed to be here at the beginning of the session. My name is Yorgos Dedes. I am the convener of the MAN in Middle Eastern Studies. Some of you may have been in the previous session um, the hour before, um, which I attended as well. And as um, my Good colleague has said, um, I, as from next year, will be the convener as well of a module that will be compulsory for the MA in Middle Eastern Studies that will have the title The Middle East in 10 Weeks or The Middle East in 10 Issues. Um, a slightly provocative title to um, entice you to sort of see the kind of challenges that scholars dealing with the Middle East um, or indeed with what um, has been challenged as, as an area to begin with, face. And um, um, Hussam has very kindly given you a taste of what one of the sessions, one of the 10 issues um, that will be examined most likely next year, I mean, not next academic session, will be the different versions of Islam and, and the way that they um, are so fundamental in our approach to, to, to um, Islamic culture, Islamic societies in the Middle East. Anyway, I do not want to go um, any further on this. Um, Amy is probably here to coordinate. I have the feeling none of you can, if I understand correctly, unmute yourselves or actually talk. We have to operate via the chat. Is that right? Um, yes, that is right. So uh, participants are able to ask questions via the Q&A function, and I can see that ah, yes, um, we had a wonder, question yes. come in already. Thank you. Sorry, Amy, I, I was... Um, so, um, um, Hussam, I, I, I'm sure you're more clued in with me. I was unable to see the Q&A. I, I was seeing on the chat. There's a Q&A with a question about Islamist movements like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, um, which preach 
violent Islam, how can we talk about the role of Islam in the region without referring to them? I'm uh, asked by Edward Speed. Um, I think the clear answer you'll find, Edward, is that is that of course we will. You know, there, there has to be mention of them as well, but uh, not in a monopolizing sort of way um, is what I'd offer as an initial comment. But but I will let my colleague uh, deal with the question more thoroughly. I would definitely um, concur with um, Yorgos. Um, you can't understand um, modern Middle East and developments concerning violence, politics, without taking into consideration these militant movements, um, ISIS and Al Qaeda. I would just say that rather than describe them as Islamist, they are in fact Salafi. They're not Islamist, even though you might hear them being referred to as Islamist. Al Qaeda does not try to present a political response to a political challenge. And in fact, Al-Qaeda, like ISIS, um, do adopt a, a non-political approach. Um, that also became challenged with the, with the ascension of ISIS in recent years. And again, you had so many um, academics going back and saying, is it Islamist? Is it Salafi? Well, it, they are Salafi, mainly in the way that they attempt to justify their acts of violence, terrorism, with reference to the Quran and Hadiths. And in fact, this is a very clear example of the literal interpretations of the Quran and Hadith that they will go back and use reference to justify acts of violence and terrorism. Um, so yes, um, these are very important movements and um, crucial in the modern Middle East, but I would definitely say they are not Islamist, they are Salafi. Um, a militant Islamist movement is Hezbollah, um, another one is Hamas. Obviously, what happened um, in the last few years, you have these militant um, Islamist movements and the militant is um, Salafi movements engaging in military conflict amongst each other. Um, but um, I would say um, ISIS and Al-Qaeda are militant um, uh, Salafi movements. And very important to emphasize not, um, that they are um, a minority of the Salafi worldview, albeit a very loud and very violent minority. Um, not all Salafis are terrorists or militants or violent individuals. Um, um, but um, ISIS and Al-Qaeda are um, adopt a literal interpretation of these texts. And in fact, in one of the sessions of the module that I teach, Modern Trends in Islam, the module on uh, the session on violence and terrorism, we focus on that session on how ISIS and Al-Qaeda try to justify these acts of violence and terrorism by going back to the sources. And I would argue that from an academic perspective, it becomes very important to try to understand the means by which these organizations try to justify these, and rather than just condemn these acts of violence, it is important to understand how they are justified. I hope I've answered that question. Coherently. Thank you. Yes, I don't think I can see another um, question on the, on the QA. Um, Amy will alert us otherwise. I thought I might add the comment, sorry, huh, that um, as part of the um, Middle East and 10 issues um, course, one issue that I think deserves great attention and may well end up being um, a leitmotif um, along the different sessions is the degree to which you could argue along with um, um, a German scholar of literature, um, Thomas Bauer, that Islam has um, been altogether a culture of ambiguity, a culture which has tolerated historically a significant amount of amphissimi ambiguity in the sense that more than one meanings, more than one interpretations are possible, and has interestingly stayed clear of what you could describe as a kind of Victorian 19th century 
European approach, which on, in the name of enlightenment emphasizes the one true and one possible right um, answer to any question um, in the name of, 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 of um, the spirit of rationalism, that there can be only one right decision and one right answer. And this has been an interesting intellectual exercise and beyond in the course of the 19th century and the reforms of the Islamic world in which an area that I myself um, am somewhat specializing in, namely the Ottoman Empire and the reforms in the 19th century of the uh, entire societal system from the Sultan at the top to various institutions um, that had strong societal links like, for instance, even the, the, the um, convents of the, of the Sufi orders and so on. Um, in the course of this great reform movement, this perestroika movement, you could say, which is called exactly that in, in Turkish, using an Arabic term, tanzimat, from tanzim, the, the, in, in an Arabic plural, um, referring to the, a, re, a restructuring and a reorganization whereby the European idea of there being one right um, answer to given problems was heartily um, endorsed and applied to Islam. And this taken to extreme, of course, goes um, has an awful lot in common with the Salafist position of, of, of not just the literal interpretation, but um, there being only one correct interpretation. And, and this goes in many ways, you could argue, against the spirit in which Islam or the various Islams historically operated, whereby um, um, even the most learned ulama, um, alim, would perhaps, it's, it's, it would be not unfair to say, would end by saying, but God knows best, leaving exactly that kind of humility, which wasn't just false humility of his interpretation, his particular interpretation being exactly that, an interpretation there, however, being room for possibly other interpretations and so on. So it's, I find it a fascinating um, and much maligned um, and misunderstood feature of, of the history of Islamic societies that this um, counterintuitive internalization of Western attitudes to, 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 to um, um, scientific truth, which is presented and supposed to be unambiguous and, and uh, um, not subject to maybe this, maybe that uh, type of interpretation, having taken hold of Islamic thinking. So um, these, these, is, these are some of the aspects that we hope to, to probe further and perhaps deeper in, in that course which I'm sure, aspects of which I'm sure are being dealt with in, as, as they have to, in Hussam's course, Modern Trends in Islam. In the meantime, Ed has, um, can one say that these three trends in Islam are predominantly rooted in the Sunni tradition. We have not said much about Shi'ism and Shi'ite tradition, though, of course, um, uh, the, 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 the Iranian um, scholars mentioned in the progressive um, uh, liberal um, camp uh, um, would have come from the Shi'i tradition. So maybe Hussam, would you like to address the question of the degree to which these trends are predominantly Sunni? Um, no, they're not predominantly Sunni. Um, even though, for example, when it comes to the origins of the Muslim Brotherhood, yes, um, that was Sunni. Um, but in fact, we'll see that these modern trends are very reformist in their nature. And they are responding to very modern challenges. And in that sense, the sectarian dimension and differences become immaterial to how these modern trends respond to these modern challenges. And um, so Islamism, as, as I mentioned, um, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the only example whereby Islamism um, um, is successful, it, um, it attains political power, um, uh, uh, political power for the more than 40 years now. Um, 
that wasn't rooted in um, the Sunni Shia um, sectarian divide. Um, the only exception to the sectarian dimension that is fundamentally rooted in Sunni Islam are the Salafis. Salafis, Salafism is a very sectarian, hyper sectarian approach. And um, they are oh, another very prominent feature of um, the Salafi trend is their, their, their anti Shi'i outlook to the extent that they become very um, violent. And not only uh, anti Shi'i in their outlook, but also anti Sufi, which also encompasses other Sunnis as well. Um, progressives, um, again, that um, sectarian dimension is immaterial. And in fact, you'll see the most, if not all, I'll go out on a limb and say that all, in fact, progressive scholars all over the world will downplay and de-emphasize any sectarian divisions because these are, in fact, um, not material to their formulation of the progressive worldview. Um, sure. Sectarianism is there, but it's not significant. Thank you, Hussam. We have a, um, we, it's now four minutes um, to the hour when we, I imagine we will be having to wrap up. So in the next couple of minutes, could you possibly address with some of the question from um, John Lawrence, or is that Lawrence John? There's a question about the relationship between Islamic thinking and socialist thinking and, and how this has changed with the decline um, of socialist politics in the Middle East. Um, um, so the connection, any connections between Islamic um, trends, trends in Islam and socialist thinking? Um, socialist, uh, some of these trends, um, particularly the Islamists, are ideology. It's ideological. And they developed as a response to the rise of different ideologies. Socialism was one prominent ideology. Um, Arab nationalism, another prominent um, ideology. Um, the Arab nationalist regimes were also socialist. Um, and Islamism developed as an uh, ideology in response to these ideologies in the 20th century. Socialist um, politics, socialist thought, um, there was another very prominent ideologue, um, so Islamist ideologue, Ali Shariati in Iran. And his Islamist ideology was to some extent, had a lot of overlap with socialism. Um, so that was a very important influence on, this, um, uh, on Islamism. Um, socialist politics, um, some of the themes that might characterize socialist politics can, there is an overlap, I would argue, with the um, social ju justice dimension of progressive Islam. Um, there might be a lot of um, overlap and um, continuities between the socialist um, themes and um, politics, and, but also the theme of um, social justice and the, and the progressive and liberal trend in Islam. Great. Thank you for delivering an answer just on, on cue um, to two minutes too. So I think... Um, we should at this moment be wrapping up and it just remains for me as i say as convener of the ma degree in middle eastern studies to thank Hussam for delivering um this taster session and perhaps apologize for the sound of the clock in the background which has come a little bit early and untimely um and uh to say that we very much look forward to welcoming some of you to saw us i think you have been given a proper taste of what lectures will be like um, in some of the major courses that you will be taking. I hope very much that you have enjoyed them and we look forward to receiving your queries and, and seeing you again soon. So it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Thank you very much and hope to see you, some of you next year. And Amy, you could make the closing remarks. If yes. Lovely. Thank you ever so much um, for this very informative session. And hopefully our attendees um, got uh, a greater insight into, um, you know, how we teach at SOAS. So thank you ever so much. Um, and yes, we'll, we'll hopefully see you in September. Lovely. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye now.